one. Welcome to DG Academy. Um, tonight we are taking an inside look at Strata, which was an exciting um, experiment in immersive theater in Pittsburgh. My name is Roland Tech. I'm the director of membership at the Dramatists Guild. And I have to my right Gab Cody um, and Sam Turek, both of whom were co-creators of Strata. And we will get into more detail about that later. Let me just give you briefly uh, just some brief biographical information. Gab Cody's plays have been staged at Quantum Theater, Coconut Grove Playhouse, Williamstown Theater Festival, Urban Stages, and Workshop Theater in New York City. And Play Scripts recently published her comedy Fat Beckett. Sam Turek, uh, his directing credits include the world premiere of Fat Beckett at Quantum Theater in Pittsburgh. Um, and in New York, Sam created Off the Top of Our Heads, winner of the Big Apple Improv Festival, The Second American Revolution, Prussia, 1866, The Magnificent Hour, Insecurity Guards, and Itamar Moses's Dorothy and Alice. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Strata, I thought it would be interesting to ask Gab and Sam to just briefly start by telling us uh, how the citizens of Pittsburgh in the summer of 2012 first became aware of something called Strata. Like, how did it first emerge on the scene? We began with an advertising campaign, um, and that campaign actually, I will as a immediately start with a side note and say they won an award and golden and a silver addy for the campaign but we began with an ad campaign of glossy slightly beatific but strange looking people in track suits um, with descriptions of uh, what could happen to you if you were refitnessed but on the posters themselves um, we just uh, had phrases i feel better i want more and um, were these posters, where were these, like bus they stops? Were, or they were, were at bus stops. They were plastered all over town. We had large um, posters on buses. What dimensions are we, like, they're, like are they as big as those? Things? Some of them were as covered this wall. In fact, okay. they were as big as this, this poster space here that you have here. Mm -hmm. And some of them were on the back of buses. And there were posters on the back of buses that were black and said just one word, which was eye consciousness. And um, we had other posters that were compilations of these images. And those posters were about the size of this wall. Um, and that's, that's how I started, or not I started, but that's how eye consciousness was introduced to the population of Pittsburgh as an idea. Oh, that's really um, tiny with that. And these were all over the place before we said anything else about it. Okay, so that was uh, starting in like July of 2012 mm -hmm. or something? Okay. I think we might have started in June. June, okay. And then when did you start then adding to the mix like, oh, this is something you can buy tickets to, and like, how did that get out? We had a lot of conversations about how we're, how were we going to relay information to the public that this was something that they could actually attend, mm -hmm. because we knew it wasn't a theater event in the most classical sense, but we also knew we wanted to sell tickets. So on the posters, we had an address which was stratapittsburgh.com. Okay. And so, and that, that website became live like shortly after these posters? At or the same at time. At the same time. Okay, so then people would go to stratapittsburgh.com and the first thing they would see is Strata, Pittsburgh's first refitnessing center, introducing eye consciousness. And then, I can't, can, let's see. The can pathway to personal enlightenment starts here. Beginning today, our strategic training research and testing agency is open to all citizens of Allegheny County and its surrounding areas. Located in downtown Pittsburgh, the Strata Center is fully equipped to deliver cutting edge proto-corrective treatment to attain clearer, brighter, happier living. We encourage all interested candidates to purchase their admission to perfection today. Okay. 
Yeah. And then so now more of this. Right. And then people would scroll down and then I see their schedule and appointment today mm -hmm. is in in lieu of purchase tickets, schedule and appointment. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's if cool. If you kept scrolling down, you'd find oh. some some testimonials. These were these were live uh, live videos. Are these all your actors? Are these your cast members? Actually, many of those are my students, okay. <laughs> except for the uh, the little kids uh, and the older gentlemen. But um, we created these images for the campaign before we cast the show. Cool, because I was curious there about that. There are a couple of people in this campaign, or maybe just Scotland. Maybe just Scotland, who's uh, who's not on this. Screen. You'll see him in the video, and he yeah. he was cast in the show. Okay, so I go to the website, and I'm um, curious enough to actually click schedule an appointment and then um, I order my tickets and then I believe um, I, I get an email with a link to a video is that right yes can uh, I want to show people the video and I when you call up the video I want to make sure it's ready that Terry's on it before we start playing it are you Terry tell me when because I want everyone who's live streaming to yeah okay so let's play this and we'll just watch your acquisition of eye consciousness is only possible through this level 10 Zeta refitnessing package. Please remember to come with your level works partner. <laughs> Having a level works partner is one of the most effective ways of staying committed to your refitnessing program. Gate appreciates the referrals of its strata members and shows this appreciation by rewarding them with clarity points. This website is a great resource for our members. Please review the five basic survival tips for your refitnessing experience. You are the keeper of your own perfection. I'd like to briefly explain another exciting benefit offered to all of our new members. Please repost to your destination as indicated in your refitnessing reservation email. Please arrive at the location and time indicated. Your safety and our anonymity are LevelWorks partners. Please speak to no one outside of your checkpoint contact coordinators. Should you be unable to attend your week fitnessing, or should you, for reasons of lack of clarity, diminishment of temporal management, substance abuse, selfishness, or other unforeseen obligation obstacles, please contact the number indicated here and in your reservation email. Your checkpoint contact coordinator will provide further instructions. Please leave valuables that you are unable to leave in a locker on the strata premises at home. Please dress comfortably. For your own safety, please refrain from tight-fitting clothing or high-heeled shoes. Congratulations. Your choices are epsilon magnetic. You are in motion. Eye consciousness is not only a state of eye. Okay. Wow. Okay. Um, and uh, I just learned that, I don't know how I missed this, that STRATA stands for Strategic... Strategic Testing... What is it? Uh, Refitnessing? Research, uh, just back it up here, slightly. Yeah. It Strategic it testing, testing Research and Training Agency. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, so I see this video, and then assuming that I don't completely freak out. <laughs> Which some people did. Well, that would just be an indication that you really needed to be refitnessed. Seriously, uh -huh. in need if of like... If you started freaking out, that would be a good indication. The hyper-epsilon level of mm -hmm. refitnessing. Okay, so then I go to... What, what you, happens you, next? It, well, as, as she said in the, um, in the video, yeah. you were given a, um, a location... Uh, to which you had to report at a certain time. And did it, it said uh, exactly who you were looking for? It said, right? look for someone. We gave them a description of the person, what they were wearing, and that they would be your checkpoint coordinator, contact coordinator. And we gave you a password. And, and a password. And at that point, you had to go through a test, okay. a short test. So, but this is, uh, I just want to be clear, this is in a public place, right? It's like somewhere it was out on, on the street. Um, or Huh? Boulevard. Yeah, a, a corner in, in downtown Pittsburgh. Okay, and uh, and then so people would go, and then what was the 
language that you used for a partner? A, a level works partner. Level works partner, which is like a friend that you would go experience it with. Yes. Okay. Um, and then, um, then the people get taken to the secret location so that nobody ever knows. How do they well, get they taken meet, there? Well, they meet uh, their checkpoint contact coordinators named Freddie. Okay. And who? He, it's always Freddie. It is always Freddie. Okay. Thank you. I was going to save that. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. <gasps> <laughs> uh, it is always Freddy. So they meet uh, bus stop Freddy, who then takes them to the next Freddy, and that Freddy walks them down the street and we down. Were right along one of the rivers in Pittsburgh. So right along one along of the rivers. The river, past a couple of bridges. Into a long alley. And and Freddy would Freddy would be sort of preparing you. He had a, a sort of patter that he would do to prepare you for um, the uh, Jeffrey the Carpenter, who is. Um, Bricolage. Bricolage is Jeffrey Carpenter and Tammy Dixon. And Jeffrey, really early on in all of our sessions, said uh, he wanted to avoid lines. He didn't want people to ever approach the experience by lining up. And it was really a brilliant stroke of genius because it created the whole beginning part of our process in which no one ever lined up. So everybody always felt like compl that it was completely about them. They were yes. completely connecting he to the... Yeah, he was themselves. determined to, to leave the sort of box office experience out of it as well. Cool. So that it uh, wasn't a recognizable so uh, th theatrical experience. You would enter a an intimidating alley, <laughs> an intimidating, uh, dank, dirty alley. And at the end of that alley, you would be guided by Freddy. And Freddy would open a door, and there would be someone else who would then a step non, you into... A nondescript gray metal door just in the side of it. And, and once alley. you stepped into that space, you were in an... In an almost spa-like reception area. Okay, I just have to interrupt. By um, what is our Twitter? Uh, is it drop hashtag, hash hashtag, hashtag new play? So if you want to tweet questions, you can tweet questions at hashtag new play. Okay. Um, so this is what you would step into. Uh, okay, so you've come out of this grimy alley, and then you come into this very pristine, nice. Okay, and then. And How then, would, uh, uh, can I just back up for a second? Mm -hmm. Because I think I left something out, okay. which is um, <laughs> uh, people have filled out a questionnaire before as part of this. Is that right? Yes. When you buy a ticket and you watch that opening video, there's also a short questionnaire. Okay. So, and the questionnaire contains some like essential, like basic biographical information or what sort of? The questionnaire is padded with que uh, questions. I wouldn't describe them as nonsense questions, but uh, questions, it's padded with a series of questions and then there are a couple of biographical questions tucked in there. Okay, and, and so, and again, a person could go alone or they could go with a friend, but right. they could not go in, in a group of more than two people. Nope. Okay, all right, so then they're there and take us through what happens here. So they meet uh, Freddie at the reception area, and she welcomes them in a very, it is a very spa-like atmosphere. She asks you to put your belongings in a locked locker. She has you sign in, and she gives you a warm towel. That's nice. It was very soothing. Okay. And, but she, and does she make it clear that she knows who you are? She yes. welcomes you by name. Oh, okay, okay. Um, then uh, you and your level works partner are taken uh, down the next hallway and given an MP3 player uh, and headset with a uh, uh, meditation on it. So you sit in a quiet space by yourself and listen to a meditation uh, uh, on an MP3 player, um, shortly after which you're collected by one of the guides and put on an elevator with your partner. And now, is it at this point that the paths of people through st the Strata experience can begin to diverge? Mm -hmm. Yes? The, the because, yes. Yeah, the okay. first room that you encounter is this one. Wow. This was a racquetball court. Mm. Uh, the, Jeffrey Carpenter, again, who... who uh, founded bricolage and was really the, the mastermind of strata. Um, bricolage, the word means um, making artful use out of what is at hand. And 
almost everything that you see in this photograph was found in the space that we were working in. It wasn't found in this configuration. No. Right. <laughs> and are you, um, are you willing to tell us what the space had been before you were well, doing your show? Well, this was <laughs> a... Um, this, the building had been... I, I think we can divulge that. Okay. It had been a, a um, Bally's Fitness Center. Okay. And so... This space was a racquetball court, and Rob Long, who is an amazing designer, um, once we decided that this was going to be the archive room, and we decided that it was going to be filled with stuff, created this beautiful mm. sculpture of stuff. Okay. And who is this woman here? She's the archivist. And does she interact with? This? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. So now... Here we get it. All right, so now I'm going to I'm going to back up a little bit because now we're sort of getting into the So you're starting to get a flavor for just how unusual this is. And and Gab, I want to ask you um as a writer um can you talk a little bit about like the difference between, you know, as a playwright, you know, working on a normal play is one thing, but then this was like you wrote these pieces which allowed for a kind of give and take, right? So how did you go about that? How did you sort of... Well, I, I've given some thought to this whole process because it was the first time I've ever written something like this. Uh, I, it's the first time something like this is exactly like this has existed. Um, and I, I've thought about my own process if I write a play on my own and how I, I think about a subject or I research it and then I synthesize that research and thought and I turn that into a piece of writing. But in this case, because it was collaborative writing, we s talked as a group of artists of, in detail over a long time. We shared source materials, and, and then I had to synthesize that group collaboration, so that conversation. And that's not unusual. I mean, collaborative groups often will have a writer who synthesizes right. what they've done. So. I so had to synthesize all of that, and I would bring in, in answer to your yeah. question, I would bring in uh, scenes in which I had written the part of the participant. So I wouldn't write exactly what they said, but I would leave the space for them to say something and then write a reaction as though they had said uh, things within a certain vein. And so I, it was an act of um, sort of writing and then improvising for myself what the possibilities uh, could be that a person might say, and then what reaction to any number of possibilities would be effective. And um, so it was <laughs> a strange process. And then sometimes we would workshop those. So I'd bring in a scene, and Sam and I would sit down, and I would read the uh, scene with the archivist, and uh, someone else would play along as though they were a participant, and we would see how that would go. And how many people were there, how many of you were there, like, sort of working the, on this from the, the beginning? The initial group was six or seven, and then we gradually brought more people, more people into the fold after we had a clearer idea of exactly what we were going to do. We had a, an opening group of Tammy Dixon, Jeffrey Carpenter, Sam Turek, um, Nina Sarnelli, Riley Harmon. Riley Harmon was the lead artist on the project, and Riley and Nina are both um, artists who came out of the CMU MFA program. And although I've sometimes described them as conceptual artists, they defy um, labeling because the CMU program says they just they turn out artists. So, um, <laughs> so the group of the t those those two artists Tammy Jeffrey Sam and I and then um the other bricolage staff creative staff was also involved and then Rob Long the designer Andrew Paul who's a sound um and technical designer as well was there for part of the time he game, introduced game designer. yeah he's a game uh, designer he actually introduced um the idea of uh video game logic into some of our conversations and we ended up utilizing that so, Sam, did, did you audition actors once you knew? There was an audition process that I was not involved in because I was working on another project at the time. I was I involved in it. It was yeah. Tammy, Jeffrey, and I. We oh. cast the show. Okay. And so you had the core group, and then you wanted to supplement, and you... 
Did well, actually, some? I don't think anybody in the core group uh, was in the cast oh. of the show. We we conceived of it. Tammy and Jeffrey and I shared directorial duties, and then um, yeah, we had we cast the show with uh, people who came to auditions. Wait, so you shared directorial duties? Can yes. you talk a little bit more about like how do you rehearse for something like this? That's an excellent question. <laughs> um, the main thing that we did was worked with the ensemble to create with them and help them to understand what the entire piece was um, going to be like for them as they experienced it and for the participants as they experienced it. We did a lot of ensemble building exercises. Um, what we knew eventually was going to happen was the cast would arrive like any cast arriving for a night that they were going to do a performance. But then, once they went off to their individual rooms, they would not really be able to interact with each other again over the course of the evening. They'd be passing the participants off to each other from room to room. So one of the major challenges that we faced was, how do you create a single ensemble that is living in the same world when um, they'll be performing basically solo. It was like we were doing 25 solo shows all at the same time, but we wanted them all to live in that same world. So lots of ensemble building, lots of talking, lots of explaining. Every night after the performances, after the rehearsals and after the performances, we'd get everybody together back in the room again to discuss what we'd learned, what we'd figured out, what we were terrified of, what was going well. And that's how we kept the group together. Did different actors start to, I, I imagine part of it is they're also developing their characters, right, mm -hmm. in the rehearsal process. So I'm wondering, like, did different characters gradually evolve slightly different relationships to the strata philosophy? Oh, definitely. And there was a question I remember from the actors early on, which was, are we employees of Strata, or do we just exist as figments who uh, live in these rooms? <laughs> you mm. know, what they, they wanted to know what their relationship to this, um, to the Gate Corporation, which I haven't mentioned. The Gate Corporation right. is the corporation that started the, the whole uh, Strata. Um, so, you know, I think each of the actors had an individual experience, and I think it was very intense for many of them. Uh, we actually have an actor here this evening, but I think that they had to be, they had to perform in a very special way because, uh, unlike other immersive theater experiences where a piece of the show will go on in front of the audience and the audience might move in and out of it, um, we asked our actors to interact directly with the audience in groups of one or sometimes two and that interaction was I know it was pretty trying on the actors it's a pretty intense um, thing to ask of someone to perform something over and over with individuals uh, in a small space and and you know I will say that I wrote for particular actors you know mm. once I knew them Cassie who's here this evening I knew her before the show and so when we thought about what she was going to do I I knew her and I thought oh well she'll be really wonderful in this particular room there she is and is that so Cassie? That's yes Cassie, and that's Cassie can Cassie. you come up and sit here do you mind because that way you could I could ask you a question so, uh, uh, so Cassie I, Bremer <laughs> Cassie <laughs> Bremer right yeah oh Thank well, you. you. Can, yeah, Thanks. You can and share the. Okay, me. we can all when, share them. When you first entered Cassie's room, this is what you'd see. Um, it was a beach. Uh, the Ooh. floor was covered with sand. You were asked to remove your shoes before entering the room so you could feel the sand under your feet. And mm. there, in a bed on the beach, was a beautiful blonde in a white shift. <laughs> and, uh, and, and then you'd meet Cassie. And Cassie, yeah. did, and um, what did you, what, what was your, what did your, before we talk about the audience experience, I'm just curious, what did your script look like? Was it? My script was unlike a lot of the other scripts, because mine was more of a, it was a monologue that directed, it was a monologue that directed the participant um, as to what to do. It wasn't really a question to answer, it was more of a, do this, now do this, do you remember when this happened? And did you have people who really didn't want to play along, who oh, gave yeah. you a lot of... So did your playwright 
or you, and or your director give you like um, sort of an arsenal of things to use? I mean, how did you prepare for that? Or is it possible to prepare for that? Maybe? Oh, it's, it's not possible <laughs> to prepare for that. No, um, <laughs> the, I guess the main thing, because my room was very intimate. Um, may I divulge? I'll, I'll hold off. It uh, was an I'll, intimate I'll, experience. I'll, I'll do this if you go too far. Okay, it was okay. an intimate experience where basically I invited you in. I described a memory that we shared that was upsetting to me. And then I asked you to join me on the bed and play with my hair. Mm. Um, and the conversation, it was never really a conversation. Well, it was sometimes because people wanted... They wanted to talk to me because it was such an intimate and um, sometimes sexual. I don't know. Some, yeah, yeah, sometimes it was a weirdly, it was intimate. We'll just say that. Um, it, it wasn't sexual. There was sexual tension. There was sexual tension. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah, no, I mean, just we're clear about that. Sure. <laughs> um, but like, but did it, it must have been very different if there were two people versus one person. My or room, did you only get one person at a time? Depending, <laughs> I, I sometimes had two people. Oh, okay. Um, there was an out. Because? If people were very uncomfortable, they could travel with a partner, but they normally ended up splitting up at some point anyway. I only had two people in my room at one point. Because your level works, what is it called? Your level works? Level works partner. partner. Your le you and your level works partner inevitably get split up That's during right. the experience? Right, okay. So Actually, actually pretty much right away. Oh, mm -hmm. we would, we okay. We would separate people and... There would be occasions where you might, down a long hallway, see your level work partner again, but you wouldn't be reunited until the end of the experience. Okay, okay. So now, I mean, you must have had someone who refused to get in the bed with you, right? Uh, I had one woman. There was one woman specifically who would not. Pretty much everybody else did. She refused, and she said, my, my husband better not either. <laughs> <laughs> to and which she, you said he did already <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to which I replied who <laughs> <laughs> okay and so there like were you improvising oh, or yeah. yeah yeah okay so there's a lot of improv here well when we looked Cassie's a wonderful improviser and when we looked for actors and went through the casting session we particularly looked for people who both were very committed, authentic performers because it was such an intimate experience. So they had to be people who you believed. Mm -hmm. um, and they also had to have improvisational skill. They had to feel comfortable improvising because it didn't matter how much I wrote the script, there would be some event that in order to fully engage with the performance, the performer would have to improvise. And weren't there cases where you had like a whole few pages of material written and you had actors who said like... I did, I wrote a, I overwrote a scene for a woman who would wash your hands. So mm. you would go into the restroom and she was the bathroom attendant and she would wash your hands. And I, I wrote her about three pages, but once we determined the timing of the evening, we realized it could only really be about three quarters of a page. But she really liked the material, and it was all about her and all ab about a story that she was telling. So as the show progressed, she would choose which part of this three-page monologue to deliver to which participant. So it's, I mean, it's interesting because, you know, I mean, every actor on every stage responds to an audience, right? I mean, it's just like an, an inevitable part of theater, and you're taking it to just like a new one step further, you're giving them like pa five pages of material and they're going to do like 60% of it depending on who they're... I really couldn't be attached. <laughs> mm -hmm. I told them to, I think that my note to the actors was embrace the chaos. Mm. So for the actor, I'm just curious, uh, Cassie, like uh, on a given night, uh, this was this show show being done all day, all, all afternoon, all night? Like, what was your day like? W were you there for two hours, five <laughs> hours, ten hours? I mean... Call was at six, mm -hmm. I believe. Call was at six o'clock, and our first participants arrived seven-ish. Um, and then I left sometimes 
Okay, so it's a long haul for you. And then also, um, for the audience member, some of them are encountering you near the beginning of their journey. Others of them are encountering you near the end of their journey, right? Mm -hmm. So their and, and whole emotional, the whole shape emotionally of the journey depends on the order of rooms they go into, mm -hmm. is that well, right? Well, some would never encounter her at all because not... Who not decides that? How does that get... Uh, de yes, Roland, you're looking lovely this evening. <laughs> oh, we're not supposed to know. <laughs> <laughs> I need some refitness. <laughs> okay, sorry. That remains a question. <laughs> okay, that will. We ha we had a couple of um, expressions we would use all the time, and that remains a question. As but well, physically, I if I'm in one room, and then I assume that the interaction with one or two actors in one room comes to a close. You're always given a choice. Somebody's mm -hmm. going to move me out of that room into the hall and to the next You're room. You're always given a choice and depending on your choice or your behavior in the room you would then move to another room. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay. Okay. Got it. And some people make epsilon magnetic choices and That's others exactly do not. Right. And, yes. you would, and you would be given something that very clearly indicated where you should go next. Mm -hmm. Okay, and then, um, but nobody would ever end up accidentally stumbling into the same room twice. That that was you. Pr you made sure that didn't happen. That pr pretty much, yeah. And if if we we also made uh, made an effort to give if uh, uh, people returned and several people did come back to do it again, uh, we made an effort to give them a different experience oh. the second time through to make sure that they'd see. They'd meet different people and see different rooms. Wow. Okay. So that's a lot of that's a lot of managing. Like, I mean, that talk about stage management. That's like a, a whole yes. jigsaw right. puzzle of its own. Um, <laughs> so, t talk to me about what what's the end? Wait. What? I, I don't know what you're no. oh, What's the end of what? T there's something interesting at the end with a bar and some music or something. What's going on there? What what? People go through all this experience, and then what happens at the end? Um, so here's a oh here's a room, the doctor room. Uh, you'd, you'd go through an examination with a doctor. In this room, your answers w would be recorded. So you would be um, asked about your level works partner in this room, and your answers would be recorded. And you would meet this gentleman at the end of your experience, after um, at, at a bar at the end of your experience. And your favorite song would be playing. Okay, because you forgot that three weeks ago when you ordered tickets, you filled out a form, and in the form they asked you what was your favorite song, yeah. right? Often, so you've, often people wouldn't even realize they, right. that their favorite song was playing. Was, oh, they wouldn't even notice. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have two people who went together, they're not both there at the same time. They'll, they'll be in eventually. They'll get there, but um, they don't arrive there at the same time. It was... It was I was just going to say it was always a really magical moment when people were reunited and realized that they hadn't had the same experience. Hmm. And then do people, are people sort of shoved out the door in some way? Or <laughs> we, we had a long discussion about whether that Many was going to be the experience. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What, what, were, what were you debating about I'll, that? I'll say something brief and then mm -hmm. you should. Um, I'll just say that one of the things that we talked about early on was why, what, what was the point of this experience for the participants and we wanted to send them into the world questioning whether everything wasn't indeed part of strata so that they would have an experience that would be intense enough that they would leave the experience and feel that the experience was going on and that did happen actually several times um, to people who thought that we had created experiences well beyond the physical space mm -hmm. that we had created it in. And we would get emails and calls. And why, why did you put that person in the really? parking garage? <laughs> I know that that person in the parking garage was definitely part of your... Really? Oh, yeah. They'd leave the experience. They'd, they'd, what we, they'd walk out on the sidewalk and be like, oh, uh, that another, person is definitely... Another of our catchphrases was, you are in the experience now. That was something that you heard many times over the course of the evening. Mm. And it's something that we continue to say to each other because we continue to be in the experience. Yeah. I, oh, please. Can, yeah. I continue to say it to uh, participants. I've had strangers come up to me in the grocery store and touch my hair. <laughs> really? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And uh, my response is always, you're in the experience now. 
<gasps> and I'll walk away really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't know how else to respond, honestly. <laughs> to say that people did. Uh, we, we had one participant who came to us and said, I'm so happy I saw the show, although my friend begged me not to come because she said it was a cult. And mm. that people were getting indoctrinated. And we, we thought this was fantastic. I mean, we created a theater show that people thought was a cult. I just thought that was... That makes a great segue. Can we show the anti-strata sure. video? Okay, so <laughs> before we show it, I just want to... Well, actually, let's just show it and then you'll explain what we're seeing. Sure. All right? Um, um, and I have to mention that we had um, wonderful collaborators, Hannah, I'll show you Nielsen Jones, quickly. and so, so um, there was a, there was a an anti campaign uh, that had a Twitter feed uh, was against Strata, and on the Twitter feed you'd find lots of information that they had had dug up on Strata and the Gate Corporation. The dirt on the Strata, dirt on yeah, Strata. Okay. and. There's a um, there was a leaked video that someone had made. Mm -hmm. Let me see if I can make this. Yeah. This was an operative had uh, infiltrated. Okay. <laughs> okay. So w was that was put on the internet and mm -hmm. all right. Okay. Yeah, there was a, yeah. There was a whole uh, there was a whole anti campaign. And you you actually. masterminded that or how did you? Well, you well all? I mean, I have to say that it was definitely a collaborative effort and uh, Riley Harmon, um, look, oh, okay. Jeffrey, Tammy, everybody who was involved. We all we definitely all talked through it. The, One of the things that we liked about it was that it here. gave the. Oh. It gave was a, there, there's a there was a tiny link down here, uh, Strata lies, and if if you click that, it uh, take you sort of through the looking glass to, okay. yeah. to the end. And one of the things that we really liked about okay. it was that it gave the whole project history, you know, because you you have to be around a while to have a, an anti campaign. Right. Right. And we really liked that idea. Yeah, right. So. So it, it, yeah, it implied that, yeah. There the leader there of, of the anti-campaign was named Rob Clifton. And uh, by, the, by the second or third week of Strata, Rob Clifton was loose in the building. And abducting people through the experience, so. Oh. Yeah. So he was messing up their experience. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, interesting. And often, he was, he was also, he also existed as a corrective for people, for participants who would go rogue. Okay. So now, <laughs> <coughs> Bricolage is known for doing site-specific work, yes? I mean, well, I, maybe not, I don't know. But like, I, when I was in Pittsburgh, I remember that I went to see something at Bricolage, and the space was their space which had been reclaimed. It had been like a, um, a sauna or mm -hmm. something, right? Like a, something like that, so yeah. I don't know. Bricolage... Is actually, I would say that Strata was a launch pad for a movement into more immersive pieces. They had done immersive pieces before. Certainly, they had taken people through m multiple interesting experiences outside of their own space, and they they have done site specific theater. Um, I think Strata m has moved the company more in that direction. There's certainly their projects on the horizon that will also be immersive projects and. Um, you know, the question is, you don't, we don't do strata again, you do something else. And um, so they are certainly, I, I think that Jeffrey and Tammy are, are really amazing artists and they are um, engaged in this community and internationally. So they've traveled a lot, they've uh, experienced LARPs, uh, which are LARPs. live action role play. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And other shows um, that you know that they've been inspired by, and so they're really a guiding force in term in Pittsburgh, certainly, and I, I think nationally. I mean, they really are 
wonderful artists and they bring people into the process and um, I, I wanted to ask about the space because it's just w w was the whole thing well or I guess I, what I want to ask is it like it's a kind of a chicken and egg thing was it like the space and then you tried to create something to maximize the use of that unusual space or did you have the idea did you all have the idea and you went searching for that abandoned Bally's fitness um, again it was really that the space um, that was Jeffrey and Tammy and they 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 had the idea of doing a show in a space and then they found they looked for spaces that might be useful they found a space and I think around the time that they found the space they approached um, Sam and me about our involvement and you know it had a huge gym is is this um, <laughs> just another example of like how Pittsburgh is so much cooler than New York I mean like <laughs> in the sense of like because I, I have this I thought we were just taking that as red <laughs> 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 I have this idea that, like, in Pittsburgh, and maybe I'm, you know, correct me, you know, if I'm wrong, but that in Pittsburgh, there's all this real estate, and that the city is, like, invested in opening doors to artists and saying, here, this is abandoned, let's use it, let's maximize its potential. Yeah, I, 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 think that, I think that it's, I mean, it's, it's chicken and egg. The, the artists know that those spaces are available. Mm -hmm. And then it's a matter of figuring out who uh, who owns the space or who's in control of it and going to them. And when artists come to those people and say, we have this idea, there's a lot of buy-in from the uh, community, from uh, real estate people. The Pittsburgh Cultural Trust is a, is a hugely uh, influential force in town that um, does have a lot of contacts with uh, the, the real estate. Um, and they were the and a co-sponsor of this of, mm -hmm. of Strata, right? Yeah. Okay. So does that and did they hold this real estate? Was this I, part of? I'm their not sure. Is that is that the case? Okay. I think so. Okay. All right. Um, so do you f both feel like you now have the bug, the immersive theater bug, and you want to do more of this kind of thing? Or yeah, it's a it's a it's a very interesting way to reach people on a level that um, going to the theater and sitting down and watching a play doesn't. And we mentioned before that uh, video games are interactive, the internet is interactive. The way people have just so quickly over the last 20 years become accustomed to picking and choosing the ways that they will interact with their entertainment. Um, means that as theater artists, we're looking for ways to uh, meet the audience in the way that they have learned they want to be met. And that's one of the reasons why this project was exciting for us and why yeah, we're interested in continuing to work in this way. We're also, you know, we'd, we'd never leave the theater as well, um, but we are seeing ways in which the, the, the play that um, Gab is writing and directing right now, um, has lots of interactive elements that, um, I don't know if they come directly to us from Strata, but there are, definitely, there are definitely things that we learned from the experience of Strata that now that we're in a proscenium theater, we're, we're using to keep the audience engaged and involved in a way that is, um, I think, more interesting for a contemporary audience than just sitting in the dark and watching a show. Does that mean you're building in intentionally like more forks in the road in the storytelling or like? Well, I'll tell you this. I'm, I am doing a production right now and it's in a very old theater in Pittsburgh and what I've heard is that that theater is going to be torn down fairly soon um, they're building a new theater and it's very very old theater and I actually said to the cast we're going to do a site specific show but the site happens to be a theater which I find amusing <laughs> because it's just silliness but it's also very true you know that how do you look at a space and you know this is this is not new we're cycling back right. I mean to we have Vanya idea. on 42nd Street mm -hmm. right. sort yeah. of the obvious. I mean and we're cycling back to ideas that they were using in 
the open theater and well before then. And, you know, so these are not a, the concept of taking theater out of a theater is not an original idea. But I do think it's progressed with the um, way that we interact with media and the way that we wh what is viewership? What does it mean for you to be part of an audience? What is an audience? Um, I think all of those things are definitely affecting the way that I think about my writing. And also the way that I write is now I find that I'm, I'm very collaborative. I often write collaboratively. And I'm, I was really thrilled to work with this team of people that was also comprised of artists um, and to have that synthesis of ideas coming from people who I wouldn't normally have thought would would be part of my process. So. How, ma how many artists were there? I mean, you're you're talking about now visual artists mm -hmm. also, right? Like, yes. So, so how many? I mean, you said Jeffrey, right? Well, Jeffrey was uh, one of the directors, and Tammy and was really one of the, the directors, really the, 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 the producer, the conceiver, producer. conceiver. But doesn't Tammy also do a lot of? Um, Am I remembering this correctly? Like when they do the radio plays, mm -hmm. does Tammy do the sound? She does. She's she does. Their, their well, Tammy program. actually, you know, I should I should correct us our earlier statement and say that Tammy did contribute to the show itself because at w some point during the show there was a very old telephone booth and you might receive a phone call in the f telephone booth. Yes. And that, and it or, would be, or rather, the phone would start ringing in the telephone booth, and you were the only person nearby. So it was your job to. Oh, neat. Answer. That and phone. and that was Tammy. Oh yeah. I should probably not reveal that. <laughs> it's too late. Too I late think it's now. too late. <laughs> okay. So so what? Who were some of the other artists? And I mean, th w was there? Is there a costume designer? There's or? a costume designer. Um, Rob Long, I mentioned earlier, Hannah Nielsen Jones, who's worked on theater like this before. There's a big group of people. I mean, for me, I, I think as as a writer, I definitely began to through the process of writing Fat Beckett, certainly, and then into this process, I I have had a letting go of my idea of what traditional theater means to me. I mean, I st I still enjoy theater um, in its most um, traditional sense, but I, I, I lately have actually found myself itching a bit, even um, sometimes when I go to the theater, because I think that there's an immediacy that is often lost in performance, um, and that immediacy is something that Sam and I grew up with because we grew up into the theater through improvisation. And so we always had this idea that whatever happened in a performance would only happen that evening and that that would be a very special experience and therefore unlike anything that you could consume in TV or film or any other medium that was recorded. So that improvisational background has been the foundation for how we've made written work. You know, it's that there is an immediacy to the performance and to the evening and to the moment of the show. So even though I'm writing a show right now, I'm putting in improvisational elements into it. So it will it will be different every every show. And and I I like that. I like the experience of of being part of something where you can feel the energy of the unexpected. And it makes the theater making maybe a little bit more like sculpture, maybe? I mean, I don't know. You have like a lot of different elements that you're kind of playing with. I don't know. If it was made of modeling clay, so it never what? dried. What? <laughs> if no. it was made of modeling clay, never dried, that would be. Yes, right, right. Like an so oil painting versus hand. acrylic or something. I don't mm. know. Anyway, sh should we open it up to questions from either the Twitter world or the real world? Um, uh, if you if you're on Twitter, our hashtag is New Play, right? Okay. Um, and uh, does anybody here in the room have a question? Yes. Cat. I'm very interested in the elements that you're bringing from Strata now into a show that's in the Okay. What could you elaborate on what you learned in Strata? I'm going to repeat the question so that people can hear. Okay, so the question is, um, um, could you elaborate um, m more specifically about what um, you've uh, 
learned from having done strata that you're now bringing into a more traditional uh, theatrical setting? Well, I think that the idea that the experience of seeing the show begins as soon as the audience member enters your realm is really important. And with this show um, that I'm writing now, I couldn't control the way that the audience bought their tickets and I couldn't control the way that they first heard about the show in the way that we did with Strata. But what I could do is base th my writing behavior <laughs> on what I knew their expectations would be and create an experience for them that started as soon as I was able to have them um, available to me. So I think that that's part of it is looking at looking holistically at um, the creation of theater as something that everything is the show. And I'm not talking about um, lobby performance. You know, I'm not talking about bringing actors improvisationally into the lobby and making them interact with. Um, the audience, although that is certainly something that you could do. Um, but I think Strata helped me conceive of what, what the onus is on the writer or the creator to lead the audience participant through the process immediately. I think so often we go to the theater and it's a series of steps, and those series of steps sort of lull us into an attitude about what we're, how we're going to experience something. And so I'm interested, as others before me have been, in how to break up that um, ex those expectations that have become so solidified. What, when you say a series of steps, are you do you mean I walk into the theater, I get my playbill, I sit down, the lights go down, the curtain comes up, the lights go up, somebody enters on stage. Is that what you mean? Right. Where, have you, where have you seen a curtain go up in the last... <laughs> in the last oh, Broadway, yeah. but oh, other okay. than that. Yeah, you're right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, curtains are expensive. Yeah, they are. Oh, okay. But that's what you mean? I mean that. How do you purchase your ticket? How do you hear about the show? Ah. How do you, when you walk into the space, what happens? Then, right, the curtain doesn't go up because there aren't curtains. But right. the show begins, and then people talk, and then there are scenic movers who move the scenery, and then there are. And, and I, it's, you know, and this is not all, this is certainly not all performance. I'm not making blanket mm -hmm. statements, but I, I find that the, the, th theater against which I would describe we are um, working or building our forms um, is, is theater where the play is um, sort of a discrete element of your evening. Right. <laughs> and the play may even pause so that the scenery can be adjusted. And then that's not the play. Or there are so, there are so many elements of the experience that are are discrete, and then we, oh now we're interacting again right. with this, and now we stop, and now we're asleep, and now, again I'm not saying that this is all theater, but I'm saying that there are these constructs that are repeated enough that they become traditional. We're, we're determined that no one fall asleep. <laughs> but no one right. to come to one of us. But you know, you just made me think of something else that's strange and interesting about this is that you know when you go to see a play you also have the experience of at intermission or even at the end of the play walking out you're talking with people mm -hmm. about the experience you're overhearing other people talk about the experience and with strata it was very much sort of a lonely kind of relationship to this well piece. at the end you joined with a big bunch of people oh. so when you left your final experience you joined a bar and there were all of the people who had been um, in your your cohort for lack of a better word so anyone who had entered the space at a certain time you would encounter and then people talked all about it oh did you go to the beach room and play with that girl's oh, okay. hair no I didn't you touched her hair and then did um, you think did you see the grandma did, did you consciously think about that because oh, like definitely. I mean it seems to me that's um, I mean not to be too crass but from a marketing point of view it seems like it's important for people to kind of for word of mouth to fuel word of yeah. mouth by having people have an opportunity to go oh my god that was unbelievable mm -hmm. or something right um, no and uh, but you are you're, you. you're 
you're, you are pointing to something. We, we did make an effort to allow people to talk with each other and to compare notes after the show. And yes, to, to generate word of mouth. We also, and this is something that we've been, we've been thinking a lot about, um, realized that the, the group catharsis that is um, so much a part of what makes great theater great theater in an experience like Strata is not something that's going to happen because you're not part of an audience that is one big group of people all experiencing the same piece of the same piece of performance together. As um, writers and directors, I have to say it was really strange because we couldn't ever watch the show with the participants. Okay. So, I just have to say, um, <clears throat> I received uh, we received a tweet here, which I feel I guess I I have an obligation to read. Okay, <laughs> this is from Lies Pittsburgh. Mm. <laughs> Lies, strata, not a theatrical performance. This is just a mask. Hashtag new play lies. Um, I think that person uh, needs to be refitnessed, and if they would immediately return to a facility and continue their refitnessing program, they would reach eye consciousness and not be so blurry. You are the keeper of your own perfection. Absolutely. Okay, now tell me about this beautiful <laughs> ass we're looking at here. <laughs> there was a peep show at Strata. Really? And, yeah, really. And um, it was, uh, it, it, uh, there was a surprise involved with the peep show. Um, uh oh. Uh, okay, but you're not going to tell us. I no, don't, don't tell no, us. No, I'm not going to tell, tell you, us. but there, there, right. there, was a, there was a surprise involved. And it, it was... Um, <laughs> There were there, we were we were looking for lots of different kinds of situations that were that were fraught that that made people have to choose make a decision. Are you going to look or are you not going to look? Uh, what does it mean if you look? What does it mean if you choose not? To well, look? I choose to look yes. at that. Just I'm saying for the, for the record. <laughs> okay. Um, and who? Wait, are there two actors? There? No, that's a it's mirror. A mirror. The whole space was filled Wait, with mirrors. Wait, that's a mirror? Mm -hmm. So you're, you're seeing, in, the, in the foreground, you're seeing the, the behind of the person, and then in the, in the background there on the left is, the, uh, is the, the mirror image of that person. Oh, well, there's a surprise. Yeah, that's the surprise. That's a great surprise. Mm -hmm. OK. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is Scotland, the, the monk, Scotland yeah. was in our advertising campaign, and, and he played a monk. And after you visited uh, Cassie, she would send you to her brother who was a monk. Oh, and he... This was a beautiful... What we don't did have a he, picture of the space, but so, it was really fantastic. And what did fantastic. he do? He did not speak. He would, he, would, he would spend time with you. He was a very, a very a beautiful, beautiful soul. Scotland has a very beautiful soul. And he would <laughs> be with you silently. He, he would pray. He, he would has do. a beautiful soul? Or his strata persona Both, has a beautiful but, soul? But Scotland mostly. Okay. Well, the reason Scotland could pull this off is he's just oh. a, lovely, a lovely human being. So you'd, you'd pray. You'd, um, uh, you'd, you'd um, bow to the floor and pray, and then he... I mean, this is all... I'm sorry, this mm -hmm. just raises an interesting mm -hmm. question, because, you know, it's like the, the tempting thing for uh, an actor is like, you know, you have to get the person to pray with you. How do you do it without <laughs> miming? Or, you know, he's not allowed to speak. So what does... How does he... Each person is like a new experiment. It like it's fascinating, right? Um, I... It was very interesting to me because I, we were in a, a close proximity. We were in a, an adjacent room, um, and I could, I could tell what was happening in his room basically. So as the you could hear or f just feel or um, I could, I couldn't hear anything because there was giggling sometimes. But that was yeah. it was almost as soon as Scotland did something, there was the just from your point in your experience, you knew to follow along. And people were so good about just doing what he wanted because you immediately meet him. The first thing he does is make eye contact with you. And it's a very intense eye contact that says, I am I am your friend. And then you just go from there. And it, it was really interesting to hear people's experiences with him. It would go from kind of an uncomfortable giggle to a very just silent agreement that this is what's happening and that's fine. 
Wow. Yeah. It reminds me of last night I went to an immersive theater thing at the Japan Society and um, we were going from room to room mm -hmm. to room and this woman who was one of the actors, she was had this amazing, quiet, commanding way of like, when it was time for us to move to another space, she would just look at us and she would go. <laughs> I mean, I'm actually not doing it the way, she was just like, you know, just very subtle, it was amazing. <laughs> like, it's incredible, like how people can. We had wonderful, wonderful And you wrote to their strengths, so there was something about him that made you think like, I want to give him silent work, yeah? Well, he had been in a mask and movement class that I taught oh, for a okay. while, so I knew okay. him well. Did And you sometimes had two actors together, or no? Rarely. Usually they were alone. The, the peep mm -hmm. show had a bouncer. Yeah, but he was outside, so he'd mm -hmm. send you in. Mm -hmm. And then were there, there were, were there also sort of ushers, or were they those also actors? Once you enter the Strata facility, Roland, and... Uh, participate in refitnessing towards gaining eye consciousness, your experience will be facilitated by um, many sometimes checkpoint coordinators, sometimes facilitators, mm -hmm. but those people will, will help you with your experience if need be. How did you come up with <laughs> Some of your language, like refitnessing, checkpoint contact coordinators. Well, one of the first things that Jeffrey did was he tasked me to write the gate language. So, oh, so you created like almost. So I like created a the language of the corporation. So that was the first thing that I did. I I I, I had um, a wonderful uh, source, which was I I had a bunch of um, health club manuals, uh -huh. and so I I read those quite a bit. <laughs> And there's just some wonderful sort of tone of lingo in there. Um, like, how did they strike you? Like, I guess it's all about like betterment and exactly. You know, yeah. So um, we built the I built the language of of the Gate Corporation, and I came in with expressions. Um, I came in with expressions that facilitators could use, and um, you know, monologues from. Uh, some of the some of the voiceover monologues that people would use and so that was one of the very first things that Jeffrey asked me to do which was create a a comprehensive language of the corporation that can be used everywhere did you ever have anybody deviate from the language oh absolutely i mean there was no there okay first of all <laughs> You can never control actors as much as you want to as a writer. <laughs> as much as, a, as you want to as a writer to get up onto the stage and tell them something. You, um, so in this environment, there was even less control, and there was an agreement that there would be an improvisational element. So therefore, people did deviate, and I don't even know the extent of those um, the, the, the again couldn't see the show couldn't see the show I I was told that um, one of our checkpoint coordinators took to um, relaying information in a way that was entirely different that we had originally determined um, as Which, as the the experience progressed um, so there were some things that were out absolutely within our control but you know the show we sometimes think about what would have happened if the show had run for an, uh, you know, another four months because the show was an organism, or this this piece was an organism in which the participants um, created an element of it, and people would s started coming back and they started planting objects around the space mm -hmm. and they started buying into oh. the anti campaign and they started creating a, a whole. Um, they started leaving stuff behind yes. in the space. Yes. It, and was, you it was an organism. Wow, that's incredible. And you didn't clean it up or anything? Well, I didn't clean it no, up, but I, mean, but I was <laughs> doing something else then. No. Okay. <laughs> All right, we have a question from Sarah Tuft. Thank you, Sarah. Um, Gab, to what extent were you able or interested in shaping experience via traditional three-act structure? Mm. Oh, oh in, in the strata thing. Right. Oh, um, wow. Mm. Well... As Cassie mentioned, there was there were elements that were fell into patterns that I couldn't um, necessarily determine. So, um, if someone might come to to Cassie's room early, or they might come to Cassie's room late in their experience. However, there was definitely 
a beginning that led you through to the sort of the end of the first act of your experience and then a series I, I knew what experiences would would be in the second act and I knew how the experience ended actually Nina Sarnelli who's a, a wonderful artist who is part of the group she really devised the um, the penultimate experience um, which then led you into the the bar experience at the end so you know there was a certain amount of information that I had so that and that we all had I mean we all discussed how we would lead people because through an experience that would have an arc and that would have an effect on them so we discussed this at length as a collaborative group and did um, our best to create a, a structure that began someplace and had an arc, had heightening within it, and, and then um, led f folks through to the end. So, were there some room ideas you had that you threw away? Oh yes, many. Mm, lots of them. Yeah. Do you want to share one? There was one that was supposed to take place on a moving train, <laughs> and wow. we just couldn't figure out a way to. Well, you know, one of the things that we talked about a lot, and that. Um, Riley Harmon, who's the, the lead artist and, and a, a, an amazing conceptual artist. And I worked, uh, we, we tried to get the, the train car room to work and we <laughs> couldn't figure out a way that it wouldn't be obviously not the train car. Mm. And, and what we managed to accomplish with almost every room was a sense that something real is happening here um and he and i he and i worked together on w one of the rooms which involved um a, a test that the participant had to take that involved watching videos um and he uh found um videos that were increasingly they were all real um they were all very gory and um the participant was prompted to continue watching increasingly gory videos. And this was something that we developed from a place where originally we had been calling it the torture room and we wanted to enact a moment of torture and we were guided by the, um, is it the Skinner box? The, 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 um, BF Skinner? Uh, I, th I think so. Yeah. Uh, the, the, the experience that the, they had put, um, test subjects through, uh, if you press this button, you're torturing someone. Oh, you mean, room. no, you mean Milgram, uh, right? Is that Milgram? Yeah. Um, thank you. And um, uh, we looked and looked and looked and looked and looked for a way that we could do that, although we knew that there was a certain, there was a certain hump of suspension of disbelief that we were never going to be able to truly get over, that everybody would always know that it wasn't that it wasn't real, that the, the idea that you were actually torturing someone through a wall or, or something like that wasn't real. So. And that, I mean, you make a good point, which is that we really strived to create immersive experiences that people could give way to, right, that they could suspend. I mean, so it actually sounds like, in a way, you were, you were cre trying to create something where people would not have to actively suspend their disbelief but you would just be kind of something like the the, the peep know. show was sort of like that well, was it was it was ultimately you you are peeping through a peephole at a scantily clad person so you are doing that that is that is actually really happening. Now right. you know that this is part of the experience that's right. been created for you. That you're not in a strip club, but you're in something that's like a strip club, and you're looking through people at someone who has agreed to be there. But you actually have to make the decision about whether you're going to look through this hole at the the person who's on the other side of it. So there's something both you understand that's not real about the experience, but there really is a scantily plaid, clad person on the other side of the of the hole and you get to decide whether you're going to look through the hole of the person or not. What made some, some people got really angry, right? A few. It happened. I'm wondering what kinds of things pushed people's okay. buttons. Well, I'll give you the thought that, that some of us have thunk, <laughs> which is that um, we, we like to describe the experience as a mirror. The space was filled with mirrors, and 
the participants were required to participate. And I think that some people, I mean, I know even for myself as a writer that going through the experience, I could never have the experience that a participant could ever. I went through, and although it required this intimacy and it required you to really give way and, and relax into what was happening, I personally couldn't do it because I was sitting there thinking, oh, I really have to shorten that. No, okay, that works. Okay, well, sh that's not what I said. No, I should tell them not to improvise. Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 that's okay. And so that was my, you know, my experience of it. And I, and I think that I, I love, of course, that people had really strong reactions, that some people loved it and some people hated it, because why make anything that people aren't going to feel passionately about one way or the other, right? You know, So I loved that some people hated it, although um, I think that the reasons they did you know, probably varied a bit, but I, I, would, have, I would probably boil it down to um, there, there was something about having to give way to the experience that was upsetting to them. Mm. What would you say, Sam? Or I Cassie, that, that, maybe? I think that's right. What do you think, Cassie? Um, hmm. uh, for me, for my room specifically, I think people really had to come to terms with the fact of whether or not they were comfortable with themselves enough to be intimate with a stranger um, in a real way. And I think my my personal experience was I learned a lot about humanity as an actor through the process um, and seeing the way that a married man reacted to sitting on a bed next to me versus a young man in college versus a woman in her late 60s which was the most beautiful experience of my life actually she she sat down and she like held me and I actually just cried wow. <laughs> it was beautiful <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think it it really forced you I think the arc of the the play as I would see it if I had gone through it I of course never can but you have an arc within yourself emotionally to see how far that you will let yourself go and how far you will let yourself be challenged in a real way because these weren't you weren't an actor you were going in as yourself mm -hmm. con being confronted with experiences like in my room where you were you had to comfort me and if you didn't comfort me what does that say about you right right because and that was the one that was my intention was I needed these people. I needed them to do something for me. Right. And that was... Which is immediately engaging. It was, right, right. It was weird well, to see how Kat, people reacted. Did, did you have a question? I'm sorry. Um, basically about the through line and the scenarios. So people going to different rooms. Have there was things. connective tissue. Um, and some of that connectivity would be... Um, we had the grandmother up as one of our slides earlier. And if you went to the grandmother's oh, room, yeah. which was like oh. a, um, almost like a nursing home room, and she would talk to you as though she knew you, and she would ask you, do you have a letter for me? Mm. And some of the people did have letters for her, and those letters, they, she would ask them to read them aloud, so they would have to open up the letter, and then they would read the letter aloud, and it would be signed by them. Yeah. And they had been given that letter in an earlier room. Mm. Uh, now I've divulged too much, too. I'm, I'm in Why? trouble. Is I'm in so much, much trouble. <laughs> but um, but there, there was connective tissue between um, experiences that people had, and certainly thematically. I mean, there were, there were definitely motifs. We spoke so much as a collaborative group about the issues that we were tackling. And so, again, the synthesis that I did was... Uh, to take those those themes and those motifs and to then wind them through or, or thread them through the piece. So I think in that way it was a it was a holistic experience. Was there track A, track B, track C that people were being sent on? Yes, Everybody there were the there were a couple experience. of experiences. Everybody but opened with similar experiences, but once they were they were cut loose, they then were go. their choices then, would determine okay. their destinies. Um, you had a question, yeah? Um, yeah. Um, given the kind of the wraparound of you know the, the setup and and the language, having grown up in Southern California, <laughs> <the> Scientology <laughs> and 
any number of actually pre-existing before that self-realization uh, movements. Um, I would wonder, at, at ten, going here, whether that element is unconsciously or consciously carried through in the way my experiences unfold. In other words, did that idea of self-actualization or whatever you want to call it become a through line in terms of how I experience it, or is that more a motif that is more of, of a subtext? Well, the construct was definitely self-actualization, so there was a lot of language around reaching eye consciousness and being refitnessed. But I, I, and, and I think that I think that it is, it is it's something that is subtextual. In, in the entire experience. But generally, once we would cut people loose, there wasn't a lot of directed, this is for your own good. Uh, you know, one of, the th one of the ways that it was subtextual or almost sub subconscious was there was, uh, there was always, you know, when you were in the halls between the experiences, voiceover playing in the hallways that was that, a similar voice to the one. Congratulations, that Roland Tech has reached eye consciousness. Mm -hmm. So you'd be sort of hearing that language of the self-actualization. But it wasn't within the scenarios. Yeah, and, and but, yeah. but it wasn't within the actual room. It, no, wasn't, it wasn't within the scenarios. Mm -hmm. And it, we, we went around this for a bit, and we talked about um, people could gain clarity points, but they never really did. Mm. <laughs> Andres, yeah? yeah? I think you talked a little bit about the logistics of um, finance. Oh, talk about the finances of doing this kind of a production. Because uh, actually, I'm curious, how many total actors were there every night there? Oh, that is a good question. Like 12, no, 15, 20? 20. Roughly, 25? 20. There were three Freddies. Um, well, I'll tell you. It's interesting because the economics are a real big question. Like, how do you? The, yeah, how the do you make it work? The economics are a really big question. I mean, luckily for Sam and for me, we we are not the production company mm -hmm. ourselves. Right. So, um, Bricolage was able because they have such a great reputation and they've done such amazing work in Pittsburgh. They have a lot of support, and they were able to create a budget for the show. So I cannot tell you much about the finances except to say that, um, you know, the experience is limited to few participants and therefore it does become a question of how do you sustain a show for a long time um, when you only have a few participants and you have many actors. You know, there it's definitely a question and I would say in this case the project was an, was an art project that was supported by the community, but if someone wanted to do this commercially, they would have to look at it in a, a different way and um, run it for a very long, you know, or run it for a certain amount of time to recoup, mm. yada yada. Well, well, how much would it take to cost if I want to experience this? I think they had a variety of rates depending on artists, or but they. I would say it was an expensive. I mean, com not uh, compared to New York in any way. <laughs> I'm sorry, I've lived in Pittsburgh too long. So now it, it was actually a very inexpensive ticket in, in New York uh, rates. But I don't know. Do you remember how okay, much the I tickets actually, were? I don't want. I don't want to say because I'm not. I'm yeah, not sure. but you could probably okay. check that out online. It's okay. probably there. Um, yeah. Question here. Were there any extreme reactions from the audience members, and what, did any of it border on like psychotherapeutic? Well, I mean, I have to recuse myself a little bit from <laughs> answering this question and say oh. that um, Sam and I were making a film for, uh, we were filming, shooting a film for a lot of the time that this was in performance, and we would go into the experience, but we didn't run. Once, once the show was up and running, we were not the people hard at work running it. So we would come in and experience it and watch it, but we, we were not on the ground. But from what I've heard... And there, Cassie maybe can... Yeah, there mm -hmm. were some strong reactions, <laughs> but the team that ran it, Caitlin, 
Roper and and I know Riley Harmon was up in the control room. They were like a well-oiled machine, and they were able to direct participants to safe places. Mm. Um, and I, I know that there was a system of sort of safety within the the whole construct as well to to make sure that everyone always felt like they were they were okay. So I didn't really see any psychotherapy per se. I didn't really devolve into that from the experiences that I saw, but it was intense. How long did it run? Uh, just for a month. One month. And is there any thought, did anybody ever, before you tore it all down, have anybody think about, like, oh, we should take this on the road? Or, yeah, not on Or the somewhere road. else? We, I don't know. Yes, and we, we talked about <coughs> extending. We talked about the, the it's really, I don't, I don't know the, the discussion of moving it ever really, um, because it was so specific to that site. And wh what is going on in that building now? I don't know. Oh. Do you want to do a show? <laughs> 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 yeah. Sure. Cassie, do you want to do you want to speak to the the psychotherapy yeah. sort of? Um. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. Uh. <laughs> I mean, I think the the most not necessarily violent reactions, but the most visceral reactions we had were actually people coming in who wanted to play the game. They were there to figure out what was going on, and I had people searching Ooh. for Rob Clifton, and the, who was in charge of the Lies campaign, and they would, they would come in, and if it had been their second time, they would cut me off and stop me talking, and I had one man offer to rescue me, and he said, I will carry you out of here, I'll get you out of here, and it was kind of like, <laughs> it was a very interesting experience to have that, versus, I mean, I, in my room personally, I didn't have anyone get very emotional because it was, um, they weren't giving me much. They were taking mostly in my room. Um, they were taking what I was giving them. Um, I think there were a few reactions towards the end of experiences that people, they, were, they would get touched by something because you had to at a certain point. If you, if you allowed yourself to open up to the experience, there's no reason, there's no way that you couldn't be touched by something. And there were um, participants who were very emotional at the end, and it it was it was fun for me not fun that's the wrong word but it was nice for me to come you know out of the dressing room afterwards and there was one woman specifically as soon as she heard her song playing when she exited the experience she broke and she just she couldn't function at that moment and we sat her down and the people who had been within her experience came out and we all sat with her and she just thanked us and it was a I wouldn't say it was psychotherapy necessarily, but I think it was therapeutic for some for some people. I, I have a friend who's a, she is a professor of statistics and she's rather dry. <laughs> and she came through the experience and it was profound for her. She didn't break down and cry. She didn't need psychotherapy, but she to just, I think yesterday, she brought up to me one of the rooms and she's there, there was a dancing room where you could dance with someone. And um, I don't know, I think that the, the idea of psychotherapy, that that, I mean, some people had strong reactions, but I would say that, you know, if you take someone to a good play and it has profound issues, that they, you know, you can expect that they're going to break down. Um, we took someone to a puppet play uh, a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> Sam and I took um, to It's Dark Outside. Oh, right. And our, we brought a friend with us, and she she lost all of her baloney. Just so. <laughs> it was um, so. What one, one, one of those? Like I don't know what's happening. And there was I nothing immersive about that experience. So <laughs> I I don't I don't think that you know that being having a reaction to to theater or to to performance or is is was exclusive to us in the sense of of people needing therapy. Yeah. It's kind of the beauty of theater in general, right. right? I mean, never know what you're going to get. Well, I think we're out of time, but thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Cassie. And thank you, Gab. And thank you, tweeter audience. <laughs> Twitter audience, sorry, tweeting audience. Um, anyway, um, thank you very much. Thanks, Roland. This was really great. Thanks. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> Do you know more? What? Do you know more? Do you feel like yes, you know more? I